Hi, everyone, and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is an impromptu live stream. I normally live stream on Thursdays. Today, um, the House of the Dragon teaser trailer dropped, so I am just going to do a, a bonus live stream here for you. Probably not going on as long as the normal ones, um, but just trying to break down uh, what we've seen here. So uh, the way I'm going to structure this today is I will break this down. I'll start out by breaking down scene by scene what we have in the trailer and also a little bit of sort of overall context uh, for those I'm very aware. There are plenty of people who are coming to, into this relatively fresh, may not have read Fire and Blood, which is where a lot of uh, this uh, material is gained from, um, and also what hints we have about how they may be presenting uh, House of the Dragon compared to how Game of Thrones uh, was presented. So that's what I'll do. After that, I will take uh, some questions. I'll try and go through the chat, pick up as many questions as I possibly can. Um, just to sort of uh, give a little bit of context, if you are new uh, to this channel, um, I should probably say I don't cover spoilers on this channel. I know there have been quite a few set leaks of pictures and the like. I won't be covering any of them. This is just about this teaser trailer. Nothing against uh, leaks, but there are plenty of other places for you to go to get them if you wish to do that. Um, the other things uh, to say is this is very early for a teaser trailer. Uh, they have not finished filming yet. They aren't near post-production yet. This is why there's no real special effects in there. We don't really see dragons in this at all. So this is very early. Um, the timing, I suspect, was probably an, an internal HBO thing. They're launching HBO Europe uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So um, I think it was timed in with sort of trying to get a bit of publicity around that rather than a, a wider publicity strategy for House of the Dragon. So that's the sort of the, the context we've got going on. And the other thing before we dive in, just to say by way of usual caveats for, for these kind of trailers, we don't have a huge amount of context yet. There, so a lot of the shots could be one thing, could be another. We, I, I will happily say what I think is most likely, but it's possible uh, that there are some shots, some scenes that aren't in, that wasn't in the book at all. The source material is a lot, lot slimmer here than it was for, say, Game of Thrones season one. Uh, there they could go almost scene for scene. Here we have one part of one book stretching across however many seasons they're going to go. So there is going to be a lot of extra material that they will be producing. Um, and George R. R. Martin deliberately made sure that this was not... Uh, one overarching objective narrative. The way that Fire and Blood is told is through a number of often conflicting stories and a historian trying to pick out the truth. So it will be interesting to see how they cover that in, uh, in House of the Dragon. Um, okay, so I think with that, we will get into the trailer itself. And if you are uh, a regular viewer, then please be ready to be wowed by my use of technology here. I have finally mastered the ability uh, to get little bits of video in. I won't play the whole video all the way through. What I'm gonna do is I will pause and I'll talk about each, each uh, screen as it comes up. So uh, what we start off with here, um, and I've taken the sound off as well, but those who um, care about these things, and I care about these things, the, the soundtrack is very moody, it's very dark, and also very clearly, uh, towards the end, there's an echo of the Game of Thrones music. They've got the same composer, so that's understandable. But they've tried to keep this feel as quite the same, but a little bit darker. Uh, so, so that's what we've got going on there. And we've got uh, Matt Smith as uh, Damon Targaryen. I will, by the way, at some point in this live stream, I've been saying it all day, Matt Smith as Damon Targaryen, I've been shortening it in my mind to Matt Damon. It's not Matt Damon. If I say Matt Damon, ignore me. This is Matt Smith as Damon Targaryen, does the voiceover. Um, and I, it's probably just for recorded for this teaser trailer rather than a part of the, an extract from, uh, from the season itself. Okay, and the first person we see here appears to be uh, Damon Targaryen. The exact context, we don't know. It's dark. 
carrying a torch could be, if I had to guess, could be beneath Dragonstone because we've had that echo before. Um, and this is where Daemon Targaryen spends a lot of this period of time on Dragonstone. So it's possible, but uh, this is one of those ones where it doesn't look plot important for us to know exactly where he is at this precise moment. Uh, but then we get to the, uh, sort of the, the the shot here that we will see from the other side in a moment. So I will talk about this in a moment, but that is, again, that is Daemon Targaryen, and that is a Rhaenyra Targaryen, who they will be married um, in, uh, probably not in the first half of the season, but by the second half of the season, they will be a married couple, which will become very important. But they are trying to set the context. 200 years before the fall of the throne. Now, this just, uh, as I say, there are probably some people coming into this uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty, lack of detail about all of the history of the Targaryen. This, so this is a prequel before Game of Thrones, 200 years before Game of Thrones, give or take. The, it depends what you mean by the fall of the throne, but give or take 200 years. The the Targaryens have been ruling the Seven Kingdoms for a hundred plus years by this point. Aegon Targaryen, Aegon the Conqueror, has come in with his two sister wives, three dragons, and they took over the continent, basically. And since then, Aegon was a strong ruler. They had a couple of weaker rulers after that. Uh, and then Jaehaerys, Jaehaerys the I comes along, and he was a good ruler. Not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I could go off on a long rant about the imperfections of Jaehaerys Targaryen, but he was the ruler that they needed at the time to solidify the rule. The, 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 the nation as a whole, Westeros, became more united. The, the boring things of nation building happened, uh, codifying laws, uh, building the King's Road, things like that happened. At the end of his reign, there wasn't an obvious successor, so they had uh, they had a great council, and this decided to uh, that Viserys should become king. We will probably pick up this story with Viserys as king. The important takeaway there is the fact that he was chosen over Rhaenys Targaryen, who will be a character we will see in this uh, this series, and that caused a little bit of consternation at the time. She kind of accepted it, uh, but grudgingly. And what we see here is the fallout of that decision to go for a male successor rather than a female one, and then where perhaps Viserys goes after it. So that's the overall context. We're uh, 200 years or so before um, uh, we get to uh, Game of Thrones. Um, let's uh, click on a little bit and see what happens next now we get and i knew this would happen we get some candles and you might not quite be able to see that but there is it's possibly a dragon it's possibly a dragon skull it appears to be massive this is possibly balerion the black dreads skull it's, again it's hard to tell it's very dark uh, quite a few of these scenes are dark so you know that's one thing they're carrying on from game of thrones um but again, there's there's uh, not huge amounts of context there. Where we can start picking up the context is at this point. This is Otto Hightower, the hand of the king, hand of the king to Viserys the first. Now he is going to be one of the crucial uh, kingmakers, quite literally in this story. He is a very ambitious man, as we'll see, ambitious for his daughter, and he marries his daughter to Viserys after Viserys's first wife dies. He also has a huge personality clash with Daemon Targaryen, who we were looking at just one moment ago. So not much here other than to point out that he is the hand of the king there. Then uh, we get a shot here of what looks like the king. This is Paddy Considine um, as Viserys, Presumably, we can't see his whole face, obviously, um, but that's certainly who it looks like. 
what he's holding there, if this is him, is probably, and this is quite an exciting moment for, for sword nerds within the Song of Ice and Fire, quite niche, but there are many of us. Uh, this is very probably Blackfire, one of the two ancestral swords of House Targaryen. This is going to have a huge role slightly later, beyond the scope of this TV series. Huge role later. But the important point here is that this is one of the symbols of, of being king. This is uh, passed down to the next person to be king. And so he has it and is recognised as being king. And then who get, who's going to have it after him? Just having that symbolically will be a show that they are rightfully uh, the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms. So after him, we get um, a cut to this is a young Rhaenyra Targaryen. Rhaenyra is Viserys's, the King Viserys's daughter from his first marriage. And he, crucially to the plot, he says she is going to take over from me. She's next in line. When I die, she will be queen. Now, this is clearly a shift from the ruling that got him into power because it went to him because he was male. Um, and now he's saying it goes to his daughter. So here we have her younger uh, and we will this indicates for us that this season one is going to take place over a period of time. We're not just going to see dragons battling dragons in the uh, the dance of the dragons the massive civil war in fact this season from what we've seen of this trailer appears to be mostly if not entirely based before the actual civil war this is about the build-up to it so this is going to be taking us back in time whether they're doing this through flashbacks or maybe just the first couple of episodes and then a time jump it's not clear yet it could happen one way or the other um but we are here seeing a, a young Rhaenyra. The candles uh, that we saw earlier are blown out. Then we get the front shot from what uh, we were looking at a little bit earlier. So here we have Daemon Targaryen. Daemon Targaryen is a massively important character in this. He is um, rogue prince is how. George R. R. Martin uh, called him. He is charismatic. He is brilliant. He is horrible. He is cruel. He is the kind of you can't take your eyes off him character. So he, at one point, he was heir to the throne. He's the younger brother of Viserys. And he has three marriages, many lovers. Um, but here, the person coming up behind him is the older Rhaenyra who he marries uh, again at some point before the Dance of the Dragons. So she is the heir, and he, the ex-heir, is now married to her. She has got children from her first marriage who uh, would then take over after her. So um, then we cut to this. Now, uh, we get a lot of shots of tourneys here in this trailer. Um, the, uh, there were lots of tourneys in the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons, so that kind of makes sense. It's not clear whether this is all one tourney. It's, it probably makes sense for them um, as, uh, as sort of screenwriters to condense a few of the tourneys into one so that Lots of things happen in one place rather than just having one and then another and then another. Uh, but what seems to be happening here, this is um, uh, a battle, a tourney battle um, between a Targaryen, you can tell from the shield, probably Daemon Targaryen, and the other person, we can't see their face or their coat of arms, but they are, and I'm not sure whether I've paused it at the exact right moment, but they are wielding a morning star. Now, this is quite a giveaway because there is a big and important character who wields a morning star in here, which is Sir Kristen Cole. He's a member of the Kingsguard. He starts out being um, uh, a 
disciple of Rhaenyra. When I say disciple, he he seems to to love her. Um, but then there is, and I said George R. R. Martin gives us different perspectives and doesn't tell us exactly what happens. Depends on whose account you read. Uh, either uh, he made a play for her and she turned him down, or she made a play for him and he turned her down. Either way, there was a rift. This was when they were a bit younger. And he switched and then put, pulled his support over to Alicent Hightower, who we will talk a little bit more about in a moment. But that's Otto Hightower's daughter, the person who uh, married the king. Now, I should pause here to say I'm throwing a lot of names, a lot of politics, a lot of marriages and, and, and family tree information at you. There is going to be a lot here. This is the, one of the more complicated. If you thought Game of Thrones had a lot of complicated interrelationships, this is going to have even more. Added to which the Targaryens do tend to have a lot of names that are very similar, and you get... Um, uh, Targaryens marrying each other. So, for example, Daemon and Rhaenyra that we were talking about, husband and wife. Also, he is her uncle. Also, before that, they were brother and sister-in-law. It's very incestuous. It's very complicated. Uh, so I lose track of the names myself sometimes, so do not feel uh, worried if you lose track. But the main characters you will very swiftly pick up. So let's uh, let's get back to this. That's uh, the attorney. Uh, then this character here is also one of the key characters that we're going to be seeing here. This is Corlys Velaryon, the sea snake. He's he's called. He's a legend in his own lifetime. He is a great sailor. He's uh, he's done nine voyages across to far flung parts of the world. This is um, one of the great uh, characters in all of fire and blood now he is also rich he is also powerful he is also um in charge of the largest fleet in the seven kingdoms and uh he is because uh, the valerians are a valerian family uh, they're not one of the dragon riding families but they are a valerian family we didn't see them in uh, Game of Thrones, but they were hugely important. Um, and the, the Velaryons um, often intermarried with the Targaryens because the Targaryens, if they couldn't marry each other, then they would do the next best thing and they would marry a Velaryon because they were also Valyrians. So that's who we've got here. There is allegedly one of the sp other spin off series in development is about him uh, and uh, and his travels. So do keep a, an, an eye out for that. I'm just uh, quickly flicking back through to make sure um, um, I don't miss any of these. Uh, I've got a couple of super chats, so if you excuse me for one moment, I'm just going to quickly uh, cut and paste them down onto my document so I do not lose them. Um, I will uh, thank the people uh, by name. First of all, Ariel Winchester, thank you very much. Uh, AK Channel TV, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, and so thank you very much to, I think I had one more that I shall just pick up on, um, the Lady Eternal. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I will answer the uh, the questions a little bit uh, later on. So we've got Corlys Velaryon, um, and uh, then after him, we get to see, or oh, just missed pausing it there, we get to see House Velaryon in all their glory. So uh, here we have Corlys there at the front. Uh, next to him on his left, our right, that is Rhaenys Targaryen, his wife. So he married uh, the queen who never was the the person who was uh, overlooked for being the, the um, ruler of the seven kingdoms. As I say, she did accept it, but grudgingly. Between them, you will see Lenor. Um, he is their son, and although it's not easy to see, I think that's probably Lena 
on the right of the screen, uh, their daughter. So that is the, the Valarion family. Now, what they did, and this may be what's happening here, um, uh, if you see, they are heading into a, um, a feast uh, there at the Red Keep. You can see the Iron Throne in the background. What they did in order to solidify the, the claim uh, of Rhaenyra, they married back into the Targaryen family. So Lenor married Rhaenyra. So we already have this pact of incredibly powerful families, and this probably should have been where all of this uh, just came back around. The Yes, Rhaenys was overlooked, but uh, then she becomes effectively the mother-in-law to the queen uh, so uh, it's it's all okay again this was the cunning plan this was what they were going to do there were two problems with this problem number one is Lenor was gay uh, so they didn't have any children Lenor and uh, and Rhaenyra um, at least allegedly officially they did but all of the children that they had did not look like him at all. They did, in fact, look like a guy called Harwin Strong, who was a member of the Kingsguard, clearly a favourite of Rhaenyra. Uh, and this uh, led to a huge amount of accusations that, uh, you know, why, that these are illegitimate children. Why on earth should they be next in line? That's skipping ahead a little bit, uh, because what we have here... Regardless, it maybe it's the wedding feast. It's uh, the the table setting certainly seems to be that way, uh, but maybe uh, maybe it's just a, a random feast. This uh, this here is Miseria, Lady Misery, <laughs> Lady Misery, and and I should probably say this as trailers do. This has dotted about a bit. There's there's not a clear strong narrative through this. They're showing us lots of different cool things, lots of different cool scenes. So this is Lady Misery. She is a favourite of, she came from Lys, uh, and she was a favourite of Daemon Targaryen. Uh, I love her, allegedly, again. And she became his mistress of whisperers. So think Varys, uh, but on the side of Daemon Targaryen and Rhaenyra Targaryen, um, and she is, if you've read the books, she is the person who is behind Blood and Cheese. Uh, she is ruthless. She is intelligent. Um, and one of two characters who are this kind of Varys-like character. The other, I don't think we see unless he's somewhere in the background that I haven't spotted. Uh, the other is uh, Laris Strong, Laris the Clubfoot Strong, who is initially the Master of Whisperers for... Um, uh, the Alicent Hightower and the Greens, but his loyalties are never 100% clear. So then we have this. This is, uh, first of all, this is Alicent Hightower. She is running through, it looks like, the Red Keep. Um, there's a couple of members of the King's Guard there. You'll see in a moment she also goes past a, um, a maester, and she's uh, heading towards the direction she's looking slightly up. Seems to be looking towards the throne. What? What is it? At this point, almost certainly she is married to the king. She's looking up to the king. She's here holding a dagger. What on earth could have been going on? Well, this is one of the crucial moments in the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons. Two groups, as we've started, started to see, have established themselves at court. One group based around Rhaenyra with her claim to the throne, which is based on the fact that the king said that she was next in line. Alicent Hightower however, married to the king, has had some children with him, and she wants her children to inherit the throne. Why? Because two reasons. Firstly, 
because, uh, or the justification, there are two justifications, I should say. Firstly, uh, because they are male heirs and the previously established precedent was male preference primogeniture. It means that a man would inherit before a woman, so her children should inherit before um, the Rhaenyra, an older child of the king, but a woman. Secondly, there's this rumour that Rhaenyra's children are illegitimate. So, although a lot of the time, if you talk to people within the Song of Ice and Fire fandom, they will say Rhaenyra clearly had the better claim. And that is true. There's no getting around the fact that she did have the better claim. The Blacks did not, they, they, they didn't just do this with no basis in in argument. There were reasons behind it. There were things that they could grasp hold of. Anyway, what's going on here is she is holding a dagger. Almost certainly what is happening is that she is um, reporting back on something that has happened between her children and the children of Rhaenyra. So, when we have these two groups uh, that are fighting each other, then that actually literally happens between their children. And her son, Aemond, her second son, Aemond, uh, has, I mean, he was provoking him, but he has had his eye cut out by the son of um, Rhaenyra. Lucerus, Lucerus, I don't know exactly how they're going to pronounce it on the show. George R. R. Martin, incidentally, is 100% relaxed about how, how you pronounce any of the names that he's got there. So pronounce these things however you wish. But her son has had his eye cut out in a fight by the son of Rhaenyra Targaryen, by a dagger, we're told. Presumably the dagger that she's carrying in her hand. Now, what does the king do? Well, he basically says stops squabbling and moves the two groups apart. Rhaenyra moves over and sets up camp on Dragonstone. Alicent Hightower and her children stay in King's Landing. It's putting off a problem. This is what Viserys does all the time. So this is an important moment here because it creates a very clear and distinct two camps and also a clear and distinct grudge between the next generation, not just between uh, Alicent Hightower and Rhaenyra. And if you're eagle-eyed, there is something that um, you may notice about that dagger. It may look a little bit familiar. It's not 100% confirmed. We have not had any of this confirmed, but it looks like, it looks like the cat's paw dagger that we saw in uh, Game of Thrones, the one that was used to kill... Uh, or attempt to kill Bran way back in season one uh, that then Littlefinger claimed, and it all got very complicated, who owned this dagger? The actual answer, incidentally, was Robert Baratheon owned it and Joffrey almost certainly stole it S and, and then gave it to the cat's paw assassin. That's a by the by. But we have a dagger here who looks very similar to that. Could it be the same one? Well, conceivably, there is, you may also remember in Game of Thrones, they did show um, a book that uh, that Sam was reading in the Citadel that had a picture of this cat's paw dagger that couldn't read all of the text, but did connect it to House Targaryen. So it certainly seems to imply that there is some sort of link there. So maybe, maybe this is a nod across to the previous show. This is the kind of thing I expect the showrunners to do, not huge, deliberate links across between the two shows, but occasional links that people who are fans will pick up on. So then we have more tourney footage. Um, I've paused it at this point deliberately because you'll see a couple of banners. It looks like everybody who's competing has a little banner with their house sigil on. Uh, the two banners we see there, House Stark uh, on, on the right and House Bolton, the flayed man, on the left. The, the North won't play a huge part in the first part, in the first season. Uh, in fact, 
that probably there's no need for them to appear at all. But again, it may well be that the, the showrunners decide people know the Starks, so they will give a little nod to them. The Starks will come into their own later on in the Dance of the Dragons, um, the Boltons less so, uh, but uh, this is just a, a little nod, I think, to the fact that this is the Seven Kingdoms covering the North as well. But here we have, uh, well, first of all, I should say that at the turn you can see uh, the sigil on the far side is House Tarly. Uh, so presumably this is a, um, a tourney being taking place um, uh, at House Tarly. And actually, if you look at the backdrop, it does look very similar to what they showed um, uh, in season six, I think, of Game of Thrones um, as being uh, uh, House Tarly's. But uh, the important thing here, as I say, there are a lot of uh, tourneys that mattered. The important thing here is that this looks like this is Rhaenyra and Alicent together watching the tourney. And the key tourney in all of this uh, that sort of sets the tone is the tourney for, to mark the fifth anniversary of the marriage of Alicent Hightower and Viserys. At that tourney, there are already, there's a, a rivalry between these two women, and they wore, at the feast at the start of this, at the tourney, they wore specifically coloured dresses. Alicent Hightower wore green, and then Rhaenyra wore the red and black of House Targaryen. And from that moment on, the two factions became known as the Greens and the Blacks. If you were a, a Green, that meant that you were supporting the Hightowers and the claim of Alicent Hightower's children. If you were of the Blacks, then you were supporting Rhaenyra and her children. Uh, let's just quickly go back. Uh, just want to make sure I haven't missed any more Super Chats again. I will uh, shout out the names now and then uh, try to um, answer any questions once I've gone through the whole of the uh, the, the trailer. Uh, Emily Pollard, I didn't see a question attached to that one, but thank you uh, very much uh, for the Super Chat. Um, and uh, Paul Cook, actually, I will just answer this one as we've got it. Uh, that looks like the cat's paw Valyrian dagger. Yes, it does indeed. So I've covered that one already. So hopefully um, uh, that's that one answered. Thank you uh, very much. Um, okay, let's move on to look now. Uh, actually, just very in incidentally, it's you pause it here. You can see one of the uh, the knights has got House Tarly. Um, sigil on uh, implying that uh, they are a member of House Tarly. This is probably Alan Tarly. This is quite a minor point, but um, he uh, attempted to, or made a play for Rhaenyra before she was uh, married, um, uh, and she turned him down. But he remained very loyal to her and was one of the most loyal people in the entirety of, of the um Dance of the Dragons. So they may be showing that uh, as part of this tourney as well. Then we get one of the most intriguing uh, bits here. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the footage. As I say, this is a very short teaser trailer. Um, what we have here, two people fighting. There's another character in the background. Now, I have heard two different interpretations of this. I would love to hear people who perhaps got slightly better eyesight than me uh, um, tell me that there are two characters here. At first glance, this appears to be Lenor Velaryon. We saw him earlier. It's the white hair, uh, the same sort of uh, length, seems um, same sort of build. But... Um, if so, then this is just presumably a training bout. We don't hear of him particularly having many uh, uh, fights himself, but it's possible, and I've heard from elsewhere, uh, that this may be the fight we were talking about earlier. If this isn't Lane or Valarion, as I say, it's a bit fuzzy because they're moving quite quickly, so it's quite hard to tell. Um, uh, and we have not yet seen the actor who is cast as Aemon Targaryen, then perhaps this is this battle between Aemon Targaryen 
um, and uh, the Velaryon uh, children, Luke Lucerus uh, and uh, Lucerus and Jacaris, uh, in which he loses, Damon loses his eye. So it that that makes sense for them to be showing it. That almost certainly we will see that scene in in season one. Uh, but as I say, it's not it's not hundred percent clear. I would love to uh, to hear people's uh, thoughts on who who that person is. So it's just a little bit too fuzzy for my old eyes, I'm afraid. Um, and then we get these wonderful shots here um, of uh, Rhaenyra with the Iron Throne or looking at the Iron Throne. She doesn't sit on it again. There are lots, I suspect there will be lots of Daenerys Targaryen vibes here of her looking at the Iron Throne but not sitting on it until much later. Uh, where when things have developed a, a lot, but one thing, and it's uh, maybe you can't see it exactly in that, but they have redesigned the Iron Throne a little bit. And what I mean by that is the Iron Throne itself. You can see the silhouette. The silhouette of the Iron Throne itself seems to be the same. However, on the steps leading up to it are lots of swords jagging out. Now. That's really interesting uh, creative design choice because this was one of the things that the fans said right from the very beginning. The fans said, that's not what the Iron Throne actually looks like. When we have the famous Iron Throne, the, the visual that we had in Game of Thrones, the way that George R. R. Martin describes it, and there's also there's a very famous uh, picture I tweeted out about it uh, um, earlier today, um, the Iron Throne, many, many more swords, many more steps and swords coming out at all different angles, coming up out the sides of the steps as well. Uh, asymmetrical, really quite ugly, but a symbol of power. Um, this isn't that, but it looks to be an attempt to say, well, we've got a very famous symbol, the Iron Throne, which we're not going to change but we want to go part way to recognizing what the Iron Throne should really look like in the books. This, I, I, it's easy to read too much into this, but I think this perhaps shows a bit about where the showrunners minds are on all of this. They are wanting to go um, the extra mile to help out the fans with a few little nods to uh, authenticities. They're very aware of the fans' reaction to season eight, uh, but they also are very keen to retain the fans of the show only, not just the book readers, which means retaining some of the visuals that are there, retaining, as I've said, the musical links, uh, retaining a lot of the feel. So what we're probably going to have is something which is, yes, a step different to Game of Thrones, uh, yes, an attempt to be perhaps closer to, to the books. We do have the whole story now, so there's no um, arguments about the extent to which the show showrunners will make up the story. We know how this all ends. Um, but then they're not going to do something completely new and different. This is going to very much still feel Game of Thronesy. So, so that I think, as I say, it's possible to read too much into this, but that gives an indication of the mindset that the showrunners are going into this with. Um, and then just to round it all off, uh, what we have is House of the Dragon and then 2022. Now, 2022 is very vague still. That's what they told us, I don't know, six months ago. Uh, it was going to be in 2022. Um, I don't, that probably reflects the fact that they they haven't finished filming. There's still an ongoing concern about you know, COVID may, may throw a spanner in the works. COVID thus far, fingers crossed, thus far has not hugely impacted on the development of House of the Dragon. They haven't had any huge shutdowns because of it. A little bit here and there. Obviously, they've had to work within protocols. Um, obviously, it was a bit slower starting than perhaps they'd have wanted. But once they've got up and running with filming, 
they've been making quite good progress. So if I had to bet, I would say maybe April 2022. I don't think we're looking at the end of 2022 at all. I think that they'll be quite keen to get this out as soon as they can. And that um, is the, uh, uh, the, the trailer. Uh, so um, I would love to, well, first of all, I would just, um, I said I would do a, a little bit of a, an overview of what this means. I've tried to sort of pick it out as it goes across. We are going to be seeing um, uh, season one covering um, not just uh, the, the Dance of the Dragons, in fact, possibly not any of the Dance of the Dragons, but it is going to cover a huge period of time. It's going to cover 10, maybe even 20 years of time. We've got younger and older actors for several of the main characters. This uh, will go from certainly partway in Viserys's reign up until perhaps the end. We crucially have not seen in any of that, nor in uh, any of the officially released uh, material, have we seen anything that is actually happens once battle has been joined. The, the way that the, the story is told in Fire and Blood is there's this long build-up with these factions forming uh, that then, um, when the king dies, there's a sort of a phony war for a while, and they sort of exchange ravens, and they say, you back down, and then the other people turn around and say, no, you back down. Uh, and then, then it's sort of there's a build-up before they actually get to full warfare. Um, so... Maybe we'll see a bit of that build up. If I had to bet, there are two obvious places to end season one. The first would be with the death of Viserys. Uh, one when he dies, they um, uh, they then move to a war footing. Even if they're not actually going into war, uh, that's where they head to or perhaps a little bit later when war actually finally becomes um, inevitable. If they're going with the Game of Thrones model, what Game of Thrones tried to do, and did very successfully, this is purely on structural grounds, is they had often the penultimate episode of any season was the big dramatic one where thing people die, battles are fought. You remember the Battle of the Blackwater or... Um, uh, Ned Stark's uh, beheading. These things were the penultimate episode uh, of a season. The last episode was tying everything up and setting things up for the next season. So perhaps, perhaps, if they sit, uh, stick to the same structure, they will have Viserys dying in the penultimate one, and then the decision being made in that final episode by the Greens that they are going to make a play and put their person on the Iron Throne. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, the sort of the overview. As I say, they could either do one long timeline and have a break partway through where all the characters age up a bit, or they have a series of flashbacks. Probably they'll go with the flashbacks thing, uh, trusting people to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, but. Uh, we, we will have to wait and see. Um, so Toth Threck and Laban Langer saying, uh, I first thought those guys were Eric and Arik, but that would probably be too far into season one. Uh, yes, I think you're probably right. Uh, also saying Toth Threck and Laban Langer saying, do we know how many seasons to expect? No, we don't. Um, we've not... Uh, well, we know that they've got season one already done. I think the clear implication is that they, they are looking for this to go beyond. To tell the story, my best guess is five seasons. I think that they're, they've got some big name actors there, notably Matt Smith. Uh, but So to tie them down to say, well, well this is going to carry on forever is not, not what they're wanting. But I, I they could tell this story in a concise five-season arc, in my view. If they wish to extend it out a bit, then uh, they could perhaps go on to six. Um, 
Okay, let's go to uh, some of the questions I had earlier um, that uh, I cut and pasted down here. So uh, Alhad Parashtakar saying, hi, Robert, where do you think they will end the series? Out of the Wolf or end of the Regency? So this is where the final season, uh, the, the end of the, the series as a whole will finish. And it's... It's a really interesting question, a good question, because, as I say, they could push out an extra season or two. Um, Fire and Blood, the book itself, goes beyond the end of the um, Dance of the Dragons. It goes to a point where things have been solidified once more. Everything is settled back down again. The, the Targaryens are not as powerful as they once were. Uh, spoiler alert, the big losers in all of this is House Targaryen. But you could end it before that if you wanted to. Uh, the two things you've, you've suggested uh, there, the Hour of the Wolf, this is uh, when I said House Stark will become important later on. Uh, House Stark basically uh, arrive. It's a long way from the north heading down, so they come down, and by the time that everybody's army is almost gone. They just have to finish off the last couple of people. And then uh, Craig and Stark looks around and realizes that he's the most powerful person in the King's Landing, becomes Hand of the King, sorts a lot of things out, ends a lot of um, infighting, uh, and uh, then just sort of walks out having bossed the whole thing. Great character, great moment. Um, that would work as an ending. It definitely would uh, uh, work as an ending. The end of the Regency is the other possible way of doing this. Um, as you say, the Fire and Blood book carries on through the Regency. The Regency is when the person who ends up after all this, Aegon III, ends up on the throne. He's just a young boy. Uh, and some Regents are set uh, there to be ruling in his stead until he reaches a maturity. Um, that's when Fire and Blood ends. He then sort of sacks everybody and says, right, I'm in charge again. And the old way of Targaryens ruling just picks up, but they aren't as powerful as they once were. So that makes a nice thematic end. But I, I have a feeling that just there is so much packed into that Regency that it would it would probably require an entire season and it would probably feel a little bit anticlimactic after all of uh, the uh, what's gone before so somewhere around the hour of um, the wolf probably would work for me uh, smith crazy saying no knowing how many places dragons have been and excusing that so you can pick anywhere if you were a dragon where would you make your home um well, what do dragons like? Dragons like heat. Dragons like um, wide areas to fly around where there's lots of things that they can eat. So Valeria was perfect for them, but um, somewhere, else, somewhere else with volcanic activity. Dragonstone works very well for them as well. I, I think probably, I mean, Dragonstone for us doesn't seem like a very nice place, but the dragons seem to like it. Even the ones that uh, like cannibal for example it's not a tame dragon it's not staying there because the targaryens are there just likes it so i think for dragons then yes uh dragonstone probably is um the uh the best uh place for them to be um couple i didn't copy the I, I thanked the person, but I didn't copy the name down, saying thank you so much for reacting to this so quickly. Appreciate all your hard work and dedication. You're very welcome. Uh, any key Lannisters in this story? Um, yes, there are key Lannisters. Uh, I think we've had one Lannister casting. They've got a couple of twins. The thing about the Lannisters here is that they are not actually... Uh, whereas in, in Game of Thrones, House Lannister is the most powerful. They're the richest family. They are not here. They, um, through the, the early part of Fire and Blood, there, there are three big families below the Targaryens. House Velaryon, that we've talked about. House Hightower, that we've talked about. Uh, House Baratheon. Those are the three big and important houses. 
yes, House Lannister are there and they are important and they will play a role coming in. Um, there are wars off in the Westerlands. Um, uh, there's Battle of the Fish Food, I think it was called, around the God's Eye Lake because so many dead bodies were, were left in there for the fish to eat. But they are not the most important. So we have to shift our mind away from what Game of Thrones thought of as being the important characters and towards uh, the world 200 years earlier. Um, uh, quick questions. Uh, I shall try and pick up a few quick questions uh, from uh, the chat. Mattia Dominique saying, do you have an interpretation of the eight-fingered hand George R. R. Martin put on his Not A Blog post? Uh, thanks to Thomas de Kirschmecker for reminding me of this. Uh, yeah, for those who, who don't know, George R. R. Martin has a blog that he insists is not a blog um, that um, he sometimes puts very cryptic things up on. Um, one of the things he put up this morning was uh, a, a picture of a hand with eight fingers on. And then it said, current mood, busy. And then there were two hash hashtags. One of them was HBO and one of them was television. So um, what does that mean? I mean, there's an art form to trying to interpret George R what George R. R. Martin is saying on uh, his Not A Blog. My, uh, my general rule is that more often than not, he's not talking about the books. Uh, so uh, he's aware everybody's always trying to interpret these things as the books. So does this mean he's making doing eight books, not seven? The hashtags were HBO and television. I I suspect that he's saying he's very busy because he's now up to eight different projects on the go for HBO. We knew it was somewhere near that number anyway. Um, so I, that's that's the obvious answer to it. It's yes i'd love it to be something about the book but the hashtags were not about the books um what are these eight things well we know house of the dragon is one of them uh we've got the callus Filarion series uh that apparently is in in the works we've got the nymeria series Ten Thousand ships which is apparently in the works we've heard rumors of a two different uh animes or animated features in some way um, there's rumours of Duncan Egg. Uh, outside of all of that, he has got other things that he's developing. Um, I have a feeling, based on you know, over-interpretation of a previous not a blog post, that we may be seeing an adaptation of Fever Dream, one of my favourite other books that he's written, uh, Vampires in the Deep South on, on uh, paddle boats is the story premise. Um, Great story. Uh, so I think that basically he's just saying that he's he's doing that, um, which is obviously fine. Um, Catherine Davidson, Wildfire, saying, Robert before a throne, are you a secret Targaryen? Uh, no, um, I'm, I'm not. I think I would, uh, Tulkus42 uh, saying, Robert is a strong. Thank you. That is exactly the right answer. Budum Tish, love it. Um, uh, Luis Rivero saying, so why does the sword Blackfire have a seven-pointed star on the pommel? I didn't spot that. Um, uh, if it is a seven-pointed star, that doesn't feel like Blackfire because that wouldn't be uh, something for them unless they had that inlaid on there as a show of, um, you know, that they're now following the faith of the seven, which the Targaryens technically were. Uh, they, they set out a whole, this is one of Harris did was set out this whole series of rules that actually they don't have to follow all of the precepts because they're different and, and better and all of these other things. So um, they're technically they were uh, adherents to the faith of the seven. Um, uh, Tobias Gulka, hi there, Tobias, saying, hey, Robert, do you see the bad reaction to season eight having a negative impact on the spin-off success? Do you hear from people being done with Game of Thrones? I mean, I... Yes, I do, but I hear far more people being willing to give this a shot. Uh, that's my general reaction. I think that there are – HBO are aware, and this is probably where I would take this, is that HBO are very aware. 
They obviously have to be upbeat. They obviously have to um, not say we recognise that we dropped the ball a little bit with season eights. They cannot say that. But they are very aware of the fact that there was a fan backlash against what happened in season eight. So what we will see, I think, increasingly over the next few months is them trying very hard to get the fans back on board. You see they've created an official HBO Game of Thrones con, a convention in February, which is not a normal convention time of year, uh, which I'm sure will be trying to get the hardcore fans back on track. Uh, so I, th I think there's a lot of people who are willing to give it a go. I think there are a few people who um, have been stung um, and uh, won't watch, but I think, I think most people will give it a go. Um, question from, um, oh, apologies, I can't uh, read the, the name, uh, but saying, how do you think Corliss Velaryon casting will affect the show in the whole Lenor Harwin plot? Will it just be a fact that Lenor is not the father? Um, yeah, I don't think it changes anything, is the short answer. The, the, the issue here is that um, Corliss Velaryon is being played by a black man, whereas uh, the way that... And it was left open wide by George R. R. Martin, but he he has made clear that how he imagined uh, the the Valerians was with pale white skin and white hair. Um, so does it matter the fact that the there's a different ethnicity for the Valerians? No, not not at all in my view. Um, the issue is that uh, the the children. It, it's not that the children don't look. Um, like uh, um, Lenor is the fact that they look very much like Harwin Strong. That's the that's the issue. Uh, and so, if the the children look, if the and I don't think we've seen Harwin Strong as an actor. Maybe I missed that casting. Um, but as long as the the children look like that uh, that actor that point still holds strong so i don't it doesn't it doesn't actually make any difference to the to the plot um either way and in, incidentally george r. r martin said if he went back and rewrote it then he probably would have had the the valerians with darker skin uh, it just makes more sense so uh, no i don't think this makes uh, any difference um uh Oh, uh, Sasuke saying Harbin was recently announced. Ryan Core, brown hair, etc. Ah, yes. Now you say this, I do remember. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, I think um, uh, I think this all should work out. A cloaked one. Hi there. Just picking up for Thomas the Kirschmacker. I love it when you do this cloaked one. Thank you very much. Saying I can't really remember if the seasons played any part in the dance. Does it just take place during a long summer? And will Cregan remind us later that winter is coming? No, and it's not quite like that. So this is one of the reasons, one of the drivers here um, actually is uh, the uh, in the north for the Northmen coming down south is, yes, they agreed, but winter did come. Uh, and uh, they, they struck a deal with the Blacks to come and support them, but winter did come and the army that was coming down was an army of men who they weren't necessarily expecting to return to the north. What happened in the north when there was a winter, uh, a lot of the time, <coughs> pardon me, was that the, a lot of the older folk, then they just sort of went off into the snows and didn't return in a kind of a self-sacrificial way. And this was another way of that happening, was that the army was people who were not expecting to return. And that plays into... Um, events a lot further on down, but it means that there's a big northern army heading down south rather than just a, sort of a, a small one. Uh, but as a as a whole, no, the which season this is in isn't um, uh, isn't as important as it is in A Song of Ice and Fire. Andrew K. By the way, thank you, uh, Andrew, Reflective Rambling, and a few other um, moderators who have uh, just dropped in. 
I didn't announce this to anyone in advance, really. I just put it out on Twitter. I thought, hey, it's easier to talk through this rather than uh, create a video for it. So uh, thank you very much, moderators. You do a fantastic job. And thank you for uh, for dropping in uh, unannounced um, uh, unannounced by me. Uh, but Andrew Kay saying, uh, Ryan Condal, who's the showrunner here, uh, seems very much a fan and student of A Song of Ice and Fire. Seems to be close to George R. R. Martin, and these glimpses seem to show he wants to include the small details uh, for the book fans. Yes, uh, I hope so. I think the one of the other things that I didn't actually say is, is always with these trailers, we always look at what there is, understandably, uh, and often miss what there isn't. And I think it's it's worth noting that that trailer, and we'll see whether this is the case in future trailers, because this is just a teaser trailer, we will have a full trailer later, I'm sure. That trailer was very focused on the black side of things. We got you know, one shot of Alicent, we got um, you know, not even the full picture of, uh, of Otto Hightower, just like his, the bottom of his face. Uh, we didn't see her children at all, except possibly in that one fight scene. Uh, so we saw one side of this, really, rather than both sides. And it's it's going to be fascinating whether they do take that sympathetic side towards the Blacks or do try and show uh, both sides. There are also some important characters like Laris Strong, the clubfoot, who isn't there, and also uh, Fire and Blood fans, Mushroom. Uh, we haven't had any confirmation of Mushroom. Um, Mushroom is an amazing character. And uh, if Ryan Condal loves us, then he will at least give us um, a little um, a cameo from Mushroom. Um, uh, Estelle saying, did you enjoy Alt Shift X Tyrion video? Do you want to uh, anything to add eagerly? Uh, I haven't seen it. No, I know I noticed that uh, that he did put out a video about Tyrion. Uh, no, I I haven't seen. I have to admit, it's one of the things that the, the the more you do create videos, the less time you have to watch anyone else's videos. So I'm I'm often very behind on what other people are doing. Uh, I did happen to notice that he did do a Tyrion video. Um, I'm sure it was excellent, as they always are. Um, quick. Um, Flicking through um, mm, the real YT saying, I'm going to give this show a try. It might be good. That's a feeling um, I get from a lot of people. Um, uh, Wex is a secret tag, a great uh, name, uh, saying a little cameo. Was that pun intended? Just a little bit. Um, uh, uh, Kolnitsky saying, you're the best. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Beres Aurelius saying uh, they could have planned out how they wanted to do it. Um, I think that uh, yeah, they the showrunners here have planned out how they will do this over a period of time. They're not just so how many seasons they want. They just haven't announced this because if this tanks, then they're not going to want to carry on just pushing this uh, this dead horse kicking it. They, they will want to do try something else, maybe the anime, maybe something completely uh, unrelated to Game of Thrones. So they know that they've got a good franchise here, but they also they know that the fandom is uh, waiting for something good to come along. Um, okay, I think with that, I, I wasn't intending to make this a very long uh, live stream. Uh, my and do, do let me know what you think about um, this format for when. When the show comes out, um, when any of the shows I'm covering come out, and they do uh, preview trailers each week, uh, what I've previously done is done uh, sort of a prepared video, which takes quite a lot of time and effort to do. Uh, but I've, I've actually found this a lot easier just to talk through, do an hour or so live stream, breaking down scene by scene. If you found that useful, please do let me know down in the comments. Similarly, if there's anything I've missed, in this trailer, it's entirely possible that I I have um, interpreting these trailers is very much this is a 
This is a community-wide process. Uh, this is my take. You've heard there will be others who've got other takes on what's going on there. And, and I'm not just here sort of trying to dig in, uh, dig in and say this is definitely this or that. If somebody's got a better idea, please let me know. I'd love to share it with people. Um, my usual Thursday live stream um, is back uh, this Thursday at 10 p.m. So uh, with that, I think I will uh, say thank you. I will probably put some links up here to things that you should definitely click on. That would be wonderful. Whatever it is I decide to put up there. Uh, but that's it for this time. Take care, everyone. I shall see you on Thursday.